Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a community real estate talk show dedicated to providing up-to-date information news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years of experience in leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a full-time realtor sharing his talents as a lawyer, a law school professor, and the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company. Together as full-time realtors, Will and I work as a team to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. On this show, we're going to be unpacking a very hot topic that you've probably heard about all over the news. It's about the real estate industry, the lawsuits, real estate in general, commissions, and home prices. We're discussing the recent National Association of Realtors settlement. It's a very complex topic, and we've reached out to a real estate colleague who owns a successful real estate company out in San Diego, California. The goal of our discussion today is really to help define and simplify what the proposed changes are if you're a buyer or seller in real estate. For consumers, there's a lot of noise from the media and it's getting confusing. So we wanna discuss the facts, exactly what the changes are and how they might affect you going forward. And we really appreciate and wanted to give a warm welcome to Marcus Feldman. So he's Hi, a everyone. CEO. Welcome, welcome. So he's a CEO, owner, and broker of Pacific Real Estate Center from San Diego, California. We love San Diego. It's a beautiful uh, place. Yes, it is. Uh, it's a boutique uh, real estate brokerage with about 30 agents in your brokerage. And Correct. you're a realtor with an attorney background. You're a licensed practicing attorney all the way in Switzerland. So you're a That's Swiss right. How yes. cool is that? Uh, yeah, that was my part of my misspent youth. Uh, yes, I got my uh, law degree in Switzerland, came to San Diego, got my master's of law uh, in San Diego, went back, worked as an attorney in international law and was just missing San Diego. And I decided to come back and, um, you know, kind of fell into real estate. So that's the short end of it. And now I've been in real estate for about 20 years, uh, founded my company about 10 years, 13 years ago, and uh, never looked back. Well, we are lucky to have you, and I know your clients love you. So oh, thank you. Yeah, because we reached out to you because you're highly respected in the real estate industry, really involved in the community. And I think that you'll really give us a fresh and clear perspective for our viewers. Uh, hopefully. Who I'll empire. try. <laughs> yeah. I'll try. So, um, yeah. yeah, welcome again. And, yeah, let's start with the foundation of the National Association of Realtors lawsuit and the settlement. Yeah, can you okay. just give us... What is it about? Yeah, on March 15th, I think most of you guys have heard of the settlement or the settlement talks, the lawsuit that have gone on. And on March 15th, NAR and uh, a number of real estate um, homeowners, they've actually reached a, an agreement, a proposed settlement, uh, which includes a payment of a fine of $418 million over, I think it's four years. They also agreed to remove the offer of compensation from the MLS, and uh, they further agreed to require any home buyer who wants to make an offer on the property that they have to be represented uh, in, a, in writing uh, with a buyer broker's agreement. These are the proposed uh, settlement terms. Now, uh, it's conditioned upon the courts, first of all, approving the settlement, but it's also important to know that the DOJ has to approve that settlement as well. So there's a lot of things that still can change, but this is kind of the gist of it. Um, NAR has already said that regardless of how this settlement, um, whether or not it'll be approved or not, uh, they've already have, have indicated that they will remove the offer of compensation from their uh, MLS field. So uh, come mid-July, there won't be any more fields of compensation uh, in the MLS. So, uh, but there's still a lot that needs to be determined and figured out between now and July. And again, it needs to be approved by not only the courts, but also the DOJ. And just to kind of clarify a little bit. So MLS is multiple listing service, Correct. and it is basically a database that real estate professionals have access to. And 
most, I would say, states have their MLS systems. I feel like some states might have more than one MLS system, but right. um, this is how realtors get the information. And this is also what's syndicated, the data in the MLS system regarding property and lots and everything else is right. what's syndicated into things that consumers would see on Zillow, on Redfin, on the other consumer facing sites that they search property on. And so the MLS right. systems feed those, right? Correct. Yes, right. that is correct. Once we put a property into the MLS uh, through IDX, it gets broadcast to all these other sites, uh, Redfin, Realist, uh, Realtor.com, Zillow, and what have you, and pushed out into hundreds and thousands of different real estate sites that all pull from the same information. That's correct. Yes. And so one of the fields within MLS was compensation. And so no longer will that field be there anymore, but it never was a consumer facing thing that they saw anyway, right? So it's a background. That is correct. Yes. That is correct. And this, uh, the buyers of these lawsuits, I think there's about 24 active lawsuits, or there were active lawsuits. Some of them are still going, and they're trying to consolidate those lawsuits into one, but that has not happened yet. There actually has been a decision not to consolidate all these lawsuits at this point in time. But the, the important thing is that the home sellers, they complained about them having to pay a fee to a buyer's agent that they, A, claim they may have not been aware of that they're paying for it. B, they felt, why would we need to pay a, de a predetermined fee to an agent that has maybe zero experience, and it's the same compensation that we pay to somebody with 20 years of experience? So uh, they just felt there was not enough transparency, and removing that field, removing the, the offer of compensation that's hidden to the public, as you pointed out, uh, hopefully will is a step in the right direction. And, you know, there's been a lot of noise, a lot of headlines in the newspapers, online, and it seems like there's a lot of confusion. So just to really uh, clarify, you know, for our audience, in terms of the compensation, so under this NAR settlement, the sellers are always, I mean, have always been allowed to offer compensation it's always been negotiable. Has anything changed besides the fact that it's not on the MLS? No. Um, sellers can still pay the buyer's commission. As a matter of fact, they can find different ways to offer that same compensation in the MLS. They just can't limit access to MLS based on the listing agent offering a certain percentage or dollar amount to the buyer. Um, I mean, they can do it in different ways. Uh, it can be a phone call between a buyer's agent and a listing agent where the buyer's agent who has a buyer calls up the listing agent and says, hey, I have a buyer. I have an interested buyer who wants to make an offer on your house. What is your seller willing to offer? And it could be the exact same commission. It could be 2%, 3%, whatever it is that the listing agent had negotiated with his client up front. And so my communication then to the buyer's agent will be, hey, yeah, we're willing to offer a 2.5% commission. The buyer's agent says, great, and he writes the offer accordingly. Uh, you could also offer uh, a specific commission on your website. You guys could have a website, consumer-facing website in Hawaii, and just say, we are offering consistently a 2.5% commission to all our buyers uh, who are going to come, or buyer's agents that are going to come uh, write offers on our listings. Uh, so there is a number of ways we can also still allow, it's also still allowed that we have a concession field in the MLS. Simply, um, you know, we have fields in the MLS that say seller is willing to offer a compensation, not a compensation, sorry, a concession of $5,000 towards carpet or towards a leaking roof. That is still allowed and we can use that concession portion to pay for realtors commissions. So there's a number of workarounds that are still there and that have not changed uh, based on this settlement. So it's really going to be up to the sellers to decide if what, what level of compensation, if any, they want to continue to provide to a potential buyer's agent or, or not, right? And then there's impacts right. if they decide that because of because there's now this transparency or it's more in the forefront because of the media attention it's gotten and everything should they decide not to provide compensation to a buyer's agent, which would be their choice, 
then what do you, what would you say some of the risks might be for a seller? Well, it could be that the buyers are not able to afford their own agent. Um, and, you know, I mean, that is a, that is a fear that buyers who are now kind of left to their own devices and they lack the protection that comes along with having somebody in your court, they will go straight to the listing agent and the listing agent owes them a fiduciary duty of honesty, Article 1 in our ethical code. Um, however, uh, there's no, you know, there's no counseling. There's no uh, suggestions as to what this particular buyer uh, who is unprotected should do. And unfortunately, in my opinion, that's kind of the thing that the buyers are going to lose out on. And so it could be penny wise, but, you know, but pound foolish to go directly to the listing agent and think that they're going to save themselves a couple of bucks. Uh, in the long run, it's not uh, it's not very smart to go into an important decision or transaction uh, without representation. I hear you. I mean, I feel uh, like if the buyer goes into it unrepresented, so they represent themselves and then they are dealing directly with the seller's agent as a customer, then they're the ones that are going to have to understand in that specific area that they're in, whatever state it is or county or city, they're going to have to understand sort of the different contingencies on that contract and be able right. to understand what's going to make sense for them to negotiate on and time right. frames and, and all of those nuances. And so they're not going to have that representation and expertise behind them if they're going out Correct. on their own, but they can if they want to. They can, and it just, it may cost them something. It may come out of their pocket. It could come out of the seller's uh, pocket. Uh, the seller may still, like, like we talked about earlier, the seller can still offer to pay for the buyer's agent's commission by way of concessions. So it's still something that the seller, um, you know, the seller could potentially pay for, uh, or at least lump it into the purchase agreement. It's the buyer's agent, obviously. It's the buyer who pays for the representation. Um, and that's been something that a lot of the, uh, a lot of people have gotten wrong over the years. I've seen on Instagram, a lot of the buyer's agents, uh, proclaiming my services are free. No, your services have never been free even before the settlement. You know, it makes me cringe because ultimately the buyer will always pay for the representation. It's just worked into, um, the sales price. Mark has great points because, you know, from the seller standpoint, the riskiest transaction is an unrepresented buyer. So Correct. in terms of paying commission, it's almost like liability insurance for paying that buyer's agent because I'd rather them be fully represented, do their due diligence, do their J-1 home inspection, review the association and condo docs, know how to right. navigate the survey with encroachments, right. you know, go through that whole due diligence. And then at the close of transaction, I mean, it's never going to be, you know, perfect 100% of the time, but at least there's a peace of mind. It's a little bit of a buffer zone between the seller and the buyer. You have an additional layer. The seller has the listing agent. If the buyer also has a representation, there is another, there is an emission insurance that could potentially also kick in. So it's just an additional layer of, of, of insurance, of a buffer, if you will, and uh, and again, it it protects the buyer. It's an investment that a buyer should make into their home. Just like you get an insurance policy if you buy any type of uh, you know appliance, they they always ask you, do you want to pay a little bit more, and you get an insurance policy with it. So I feel buyers are well advised to be protected and 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 get a representation for what's probably the most expensive thing that they'll ever purchase in their entire lives. Why would you go in there without an experienced agent by your side? I've seen some um, cases in transactions where a buyer might hire an attorney. So that's getting some representation, right? I mean, that's different from a buyer's agent because they won't necessarily have the market expertise, but at least they're getting support on the contract side. Right, support on the contract side, but that attorney isn't going to join them during the physical inspection. That attorney isn't going to hold their hand when all of a sudden the lender is running into a time delay and you have to negotiate with the seller uh, a way to extend uh, all the time frames. The attorney is just going to help them write the contract and then say, voila, 
um, call me at the end of uh, you know at the end of the at the end of the transaction. So there's yeah, having an attorney draw up the contract isn't really the help that I was referring to. Got it. Yeah. So we have spent an immense time, you know, in the front half, pretty intense. And as you can see, this is such a hot topic. And we've spent a lot of time focused on talking about the sell side because there's so much, you know, when you're listing a property, when you're the seller of a property, let's shift gears and talk about when you're on the buy side. Okay. So there, due to the settlement, now there is a change that NAR has agreed to. And they're saying that if you are a buyer, that you must sign a buyer's representation agreement before right. you're able to, before the buyer's agent is able to show you a property. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Right. That's the proposed uh, settlement. Proposed, right. And again, uh, the DOJ can weigh in. And just as a side note, uh, the DOJ's approval could prove to be a hurdle because the DOJ has long had a feud with NAR. And it could very well be that the DOJ uh, proves to be the stumbling block in this in this settlement. Um, we will see as we progress. Uh, but to your question, yeah, the, the buyer, um, you know, the buyer has a choice. Do they want to be represented or do they want to go straight to the listing agent and not be represented and have the listing agent be a dual agent um, and handle it that way? Um, you know, and every buyer's agent out there has to come up with a decision. How much am I going to charge for my services? Am I a brand new agent and I'm going to try to get experience and I'm going to offer a flat fee or am I an experienced agent who knows my worth and I'm going to say, no, um, I'm going to charge two, two and a half, three percent commission because that's what I'm worth because uh, I come with all this experience. And that has to be something that we'll see um, how it's going to shake out. Are there going to be a new crop of agents popping up in the next few months who specialize in simply getting a number of buyers into homes and, and, you know, don't work, you know, don't care about any representation, just get them in the homes, uh, with the buyer brokers agreement. There's still a lot thing, a lot of things that have to be determined and we'll just see how things shake out in the next few months. I'm not sure if that was I'm not sure if that was the answer of your question. No, it's great discussion. Uh, it is, it is, yeah. And, and you know, how do you think the buyers are would feel when you know any agents that come up to them and they're like, "Okay, you have to sign this document before I could show you the property," or it could be online. You know, I mean, it could be possibly an automated process, but I think you know it would be important for the agent to actually go over it in person or a video call before they signed the by a representation agreement because it could be like a year agreement, right? Or six months. 100%. You cannot surprise a buyer with the buyer broker's agreement when you meet them. You can't trap them. My suggestion to our agents has always been talk to your clients as soon as possible. When you have the first conversation with them over the phone, introduce the buyer broker's agreement. Say, hey, here's how I work and educate your client. Then when you meet them for the first time, would you have a buyer broker's agreement signed? Maybe not. Let them, you know, meet them, uh, you know, let them see how you work. But at least on the second time that you're going to meet with them and they're, you realize they're getting more serious, they've gotten approved with the lender. At that point, you can bring up the buyer broker's agreement again and say, hey, remember how we talked about this agreement? Here's how I work. And now that we've reached this point, now I really need you guys to solidify the relationship that we have. You've seen how I work. You've seen how I take my business seriously. And um, now it's time for us to solidify our relationship. It binds you to me, but it also binds me to you. Do you think, I mean, I find it interesting because it's almost been the culture of our real estate industry as a whole. I mean, I've been in it for over 20 years now. And Same it's here. like, when you represent a seller, when you're going to help them sell a home, you know, there's no question that you're going to be reviewing right. the listing agreement, right? I mean, right. that's that's like, it's basic. And then they expect that too, or at least we assumptively think they expect it, but we, you know, we'll definitely present them with the listing agreement. Here's right. what we do. Here's what your role right. is. Here's what we're going to, you know, all that. So why wouldn't the same apply on the buy side? And the buyer's representation agreement has been there forever. However, 
as a culture, as realtors, I think in the industry, it's not been a widely adopted practice, right? And I don't know why that is, but it's just been that way. So now it's kind of making a fundamental part of what we do. It's bringing that to the forefront. Right. I think it's because we didn't have to. I've been in the industry for 20 plus years and I maybe have signed one or two buyer brokers agreement because we never really had to. And I kind of prided myself that I didn't need a written agreement between me and my clients. They were loyal to me because they wanted to be loyal. And I was not worried that they would go somewhere else because of the relationship that I had with them. Now things have obviously changed, but I say this is a good change because it is time for us to list our buyers and to solidify that relationship in writing and to kind of separate the good clients from the bad. If the client doesn't want to sign a buyer broker's agreement with me, then I don't want to waste my time. And I'm better off knowing that this particular buyer has an issue with me uh, or doesn't want to sign it with me than working with this particular buyer for three months or six months only to see that they get, went into escrow with another agent. So I, I think this is a change that has been long overdue, and I actually welcome this change. It's a little bit of a, obviously a change. We need to kind of refigure our, our industry or maybe refigure the way we do business, but change is always good. And I think this is a good change. I agree with you. And I think one of the questions would be like, so when a buyer does agree to sign the buyer's representation agreement, they're like, Marcus, yes, I want to work with you. You know, I want you to help me with navigating the biggest purchase of my life. Is the the detail aspect of it in terms of the compensation. So now the buyer, how does that work? The compensation piece, like is the buyer going to, how, how do you see that kind of playing out on the buyer's rep agreement? Um, here's the most important word. It's negotiable. Just like when you meet with the seller, the commissions have always been negotiable. Uh, and this is what I think the media has gotten wrong Real estate commissions aren't going away. Real estate commissions aren't necessarily even going to drop. It's simply that we're going to be open and talk about the amount of compensation that we make and that we deserve. And that's up to each individual. You know, do I deserve 2%? Do I deserve 2.5%, 3%? Do I deserve $5,000? That is my decision to make. And, um, you know, it's, but it's a conversation that should have been had with, the buyer a long time ago. Now it's a discussion that will have to be had. And I, again, I welcome this. You sit down with your buyer and you say, this is what I charge for my services. And that's different for you. That's different from me. It could be an industry standard, um, you know, but that's something that you'll have to come to grips with. And you have to be able to articulate to your clients, to your buyers, why are you charging 3% and I can go next door and I have a brand new agent who does who, who claims to do the exact same thing for five thousand dollars. What is the value add that you bring to the table that separates you but makes you more valuable to me as a buyer? And if you cannot articulate that value proposition, then um, why would yeah. a buyer want to go with you uh, and be charged two and a half percent when they could just simply go down the street and and get with somebody who just got his license? for $5,000. So do you think it's true that it's like that across all industries, not just the real estate industry? I 100%. mean, yes. when you think Agreed. about medical, you know, there's different doctors that you go to. I mean, there's just different varying levels of expertise or right. for attorneys, any professional industry. It's not just isolated to the real estate industry. Right. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't make sense that an agent who just got his license yesterday writes an offer on the $3 million property and doesn't really do much for his client, gets the exact same amount as somebody who has worked in the industry for 20 years and accompanies the, the buyer at every single turn. Um, so I think that's another one of these reasons why this uh, settlement I think is good because it does open up the ability for a buyer to choose. What type of representation do I want? And uh, some buyers, again, you know what? This is their prerogative. They may want to go with uh, the cheap version, 100%. We have buyers uh, that get a cheap haircut. We have buyers that get a vehicle be you know, based on how cheap it is, and that's their prerogative. But just for any profession, 
there is an entry level and there's the expert level and that comes at a different charge it, it's it's not only in our industry the same way attorneys medical field it's the same way everywhere so this is not unusual absolutely yeah and you know leone and i were having a conversation about i think too often times we shield our clients from what we actually do all the behind the scenes stuff so then maybe on social media or you know when we're on a phone call with our clients it's like wow that was a smooth transaction right you know like you guys are awesome but so what what did you guys really do behind the scenes and as we right. all know we do a lot behind the scenes some sometimes we have to do some yard work sometimes we have to do some negotiations some moving boxes and i think it, you know because of this whole settlement and because of this, this hot topic issue it's like well, we are going to tell our clients what we exactly do. Right. You know, and, and you, you better. Say, yeah. You, you better or else you're not going to be able to articulate your value. We're going to be able to, and we have to, able to articulate what value do we bring to the table. Um, yeah. You know, kind of like building on what you just said. If I take a plane from San Diego to Hawaii, I get off at the airport. And I'm like, this is easy. I could have done that. Because I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, what it takes to fly an airplane. Um, after a transaction, a buyer could look back and go, gosh, that was really easy. I could have represented myself. What we exactly. don't know is what happened behind the scenes, the phone calls that I had to make with the lender, the phone calls I had to do with the listing agent, trying to talk him off the, the ledge when the buyer submits a $10,000 repair request. Um, you know, talking to movers, talking to... Uh, different people that are part of this equation of the physical inspection company trying to figure out what does it mean when the physical inspection report mentions a line that, that none of us understand. Uh, all this extra work that goes on, it, the buyer usually has no idea because we try to make it very smooth. We try to keep everything moving forward very smoothly. And often I don't necessarily share uh, every single hurdle with the buyer because I don't want them to freak out. Right. Same as us. So I, right. I think more and more, yeah, it's just it's just being more transparent on what we do, all the negotiations behind the scene so that right. they're not emotionally affected. That that could right. weigh anyone down, either the home seller or the buyer. But exactly. Yeah, so this is like, we could go on and I mean, <laughs> this is fantastic. I mean, you, you were like so awesome and Thank you so much for your time, Marcus. Um, you know, if people want to Every reach time. out to you, how do people reach out to you? I, uh, I think we have contact information on one of the slides. Yeah, they can reach out to me via Instagram. Obviously, we know each other uh, through Instagram. I have had a number of referrals over, over the years, and I specifically look for people that play in the same sandbox as I do because I want to reward them. Uh, you know, we're looking at Instagram as a potential referral base, obviously. And so it's nice to see that our efforts pay off. Um, and so obviously, yes, reach out to me on Instagram. Um, and uh, what's you know, your tag? Well, what is it? It's uh, at? It's Marcus.Feldman, the number four, R-E for real estate. So R-E for real estate. And one more thing, you guys, I do want to plug uh, a, a Instagram live they're going to be having on the 24th of April, next Wednesday, I was able to get the CEO of SDMLS. He, uh, his name is Saul Klein, and um, he is a nationally known expert on all things MLS. And we will talk about, uh, in an Instagram Live, we will talk about, again, the NAR settlement, but not necessarily the NAR settlement. I feel at some point people have... Uh, heard enough about the NAR settlement. What we're going to talk about is things that uh, are kind of the next level questions. For instance, how are you as an agent dealing, Mister? How are you as an agent dealing with people that come to your open house? Do you sign up every single buyer who walks into your open house? Another question is, what does the agreement do for the enforceability of a buyer broker's agreement? How are we as agent protected? If we have a buyer broker's agreement, yet the buyer decides to cut us out, and if we chase after the commission, are they going to badmouth us on social media? What um, what can we do 
to prevent that? Is there anything in NAR's settlement that per, that would make potentially an enforceability of our agreement that we're hopefully going to get uh, more plausible and more easily um, reachable? Or are we just going to be out uh, left, to, left to dry, so to speak, uh, as far as enforceability of this agreement? Because, you know, having an agreement is only half the story. We need to be able to get that agreement in force. And what's going to happen? Because yeah. you guys know, what would you rather have, you know, a commission or a negative review? Exactly. And, yeah. and so, you know, so we're going to talk about, I guess, some of these questions that, that go a little bit deeper into uh, this settlement and the consequences uh, of the settlement. So I invite all you guys to um, obviously follow me on Instagram and tune in next Wednesday um san diego time pacific standard time at 4 p.m uh which is one o'clock your time to uh to time in to, to chime in and, and tune in to a discussion about the settlement it'll go a little bit deeper because i think we covered just kind of the gist of it we covered the basic uh of this agreement but we will dive in a little bit deeper into what it could potentially mean and and uh you guys obviously are welcome to join okay that's awesome. No, thank you for the for the note on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yes. We'll definitely be joining. But yes. thank you for being an amazing guest, Marcus. I mean, thank I really, you, Marcus. really appreciate it. Thanks you. for having me. Yes, anytime. And aloha. aloha. Okay, aloha. <laughs> We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.